Hello! Today I'm looking at one of the most critically acclaimed and visually recognisable Studio Ghibli films to have entered the Western mainstream, 1988's My Neighbour Totoro. Instantly recognisable as one of the studio's most visually striking character creations, Totoro has become synonymous with the Studio Ghibli brand, to the extent that since the film's release he's featured as the centrepiece of their logo lockup. The protagonists Satsuki and Mei and their interactions with this acorn-obsessed giant serve as the centrepieces around which most of the film hinges, and are what gives the movie its heartwarming, life-is-good vibes. But the impact and the appeal of this movie doesn't just extend to this eponymous character, but rather the fantastic artistic flourishes that bring it to life, and you know, the homes and the countryside around which the movie takes place is as much a part of the movie's characterization as the creatures and protagonists within it. This is owed largely, I believe, to the collaboration of Kazuo Oga, who went on to become the art director for numerous future Ghibli installments. Now, the magical aspect of My Neighbor Totoro isn't just the supernatural things that take place, but also the setting, which has this sense of timelessness about it. And although it's often regarded as being set in the 1950s, this isn't officially confirmed, and the only indicators we have of a distinct historical setting is the lack of mobile phones, firstly, and the archaic design of the motor vehicles, which themselves are you know, reasonably ambiguous regardless. So this timelessness and Twilight Zone-esque dimension of the movie is further communicated by the curious happenings in the story, for example, there's a scene where Mei crawls through the bushes to first discover Totoro, only to find a few hours later that the path no longer exists. There's instances where we see seedlings grow into monstrous trees in a matter of seconds, only to disappear the next day. And of course, the existence of a slightly menacing cat bus that nobody else seems to be able to see. In terms of themes, My Neighbor Totoro is much less heavy-handed than predecessors such as Nausicaa Valley of the Wind and Laputa Castle in the Sky, which deal with the ugly, uglier aspects of mankind such as greed, war, and you know their impact on nature. Totoro, on the other hand, looks at nature in a more positive and celebratory light, and I think it's prudent that our protagonists are two children that have moved out into the countryside as they have this revelatory experience at being introduced to the wonder of nature for the first time. And the film succeeds well in capturing something we all by and large take for granted, such as trees and meadows and, and things like that, which are actually quite momentous when you take, take the time to kind of consider them. Now, it's never outrightly stated whether Totoro is a spirit or some sort of animal, but what is certain is that the character is introduced as a guardian of sorts, of the surrounding woodland and nature. And this ties in, I think, with the Japanese roots in both Shinto and Buddhism, and particularly with the animist nature of Shinto, which sees all natural things imbibed with their own respective spirits, known as kami. Now, although from my own analytical and critiquing perspective this seemed quite clear as a thematic correlation with you know this Japanese belief system. What's con convinced me further is the presence and interaction with Shinto shrines throughout the film wherein we actually see Satsuki and Mei shelter from the rain and you know pay respects to one. However despite this and you know I, I feel quite firmly that this is the case Hayao Miyazaki has actually come out and iterated more than once that the movie has no religious connotations whatsoever, and the observation of this um, Shinto respect uh, is more a, a cultural thing rather than an overt kind of religious angle that they're taking with this film. To contest this slightly though, I would argue that as a biotopist, as he describes himself, and a defender of nature, Miyazaki does inadvertently channel this Shintoist ideal, which, rather than an overt structured religious sensibility in this case, is more an ingrained aspect of a traditional Japanese mindset, particularly those that advocate a oneness with nature and a respect of this animism and woodland sentience. So Totoro as an avatar for nature and through showing the girls the wonderment of natural things, the movie treads 
the same territory as movies such as Nausicaa and you know they celebrate nature but in a in a more, much more optimistic way furthermore the movie explores the themes of growing up and in some respects a loss of innocence like in Kiki's delivery service which I'll be discussing at a later date and the way in which we see this is how aspects of trauma and an awareness of the concept of death begin to shine through. At certain points of the film, the light-heartedness is eclipsed by the elephant in the room, which is of course the absence of a maternal figure in the children's lives. We quickly learn that their mother is in the hospital with an unspecified illness, and, you know, it's ongoing and it's ambiguous as to her state and potential for recovery. So what we find in this storyline is the children, and particularly Satsuki, are introduced in a very literal way to the prospect of death. The only moment of conflict we have in this movie comes when Satsuki breaks down and shouts at her little sister that, you know, their mother might die, which severely upsets both of them. Mei then runs off, and while looking for her, the villagers come across a child's shoe floating in a pond, which leads them to believe, but not outrightly say that she may well have drowned and you know while this doesn't turn out to be the case these are the two instances of trauma and the 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 lingering theme of death that the the adolescent Satsuki kind of grapples with throughout this film and they sort of in a very subtle way urge her into the realms of adulthood about the nature of human mortality Further to Satsuki's coming-of-age story arc are her infrequent run-ins with the neighbourhood boy Kanta, who clearly and quite humorously doesn't know how to interact with her, which plays on this kind of first contact with the opposite sex that children have as they develop into their teenage years. Now, naturally, Totoro has a happy ending, and it contrasts quite starkly with the harrowing Grave of the Fireflies, which was released alongside it. Such is the wholesome and simplistically innocent nature of My Neighbour Totoro that many studious pseudo-academics have tried applying a more menacing undertone to this film. And the most prominent fan theory hinting is that Totoro is some sort of god of death, much like Ryuk in the Death Note series. And the theory goes so far as to state that Mei, the little sister, in fact dies, and the mother also dies, which permits the children to see Totoro in the first place. And to this end, I think that although the remit for analysis and interpreting, you know, films and texts and media to consider a more subtle artistic intent is a very good thing to do, and it's something that, of course, I, you know, the purpose of this channel is to do that, I feel that this theory is extremely flaky in how it's described and advocated. And secondly, it's entirely out of synchronisation with not only what we expect from Studio Ghibli, you know, and the output as an animation studio, but also with the general tone of the film. I feel that it, it, it jars entirely with the optimism and thematic ethos that we've that we've so far been watching in this film. And the movie is so much more about celebrating the natural world uh, rather than its existential plights, you know, of, of human beings. And just to kind of put a nail in the coffin of this theory, as I see it, uh, the ending credits show the whole family together again in this kind of quite humorous, you know, um, slideshow animation with the addition of a, a baby sister as well. So this furthermore shows that, you know, there's a you know, there's a conciliatory end to Totoro and, you know, the family is growing and, you know, blossoming further. And also, and I think this is kind of slightly lesser known about because it hasn't seen a Western release, but there is a, a sequel to My Neighbour Totoro called May and the Kitten Bus, which is a short film by Goro Miyazaki, um, Hayao Miyazaki's son, which I believe is only periodically shown at the Ghibli Museum in Japan, although there is a few poorly pirated versions floating around on the internet, but, you know, I've tried having a look at them and they're of such a dismal quality that I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, attempting to watch them. So, just to wrap up, My Neighbour Totoro is a milestone Ghibli film which introduced its most memorable character and it's firmly, 
low stress, good feel vibes to to a new audience. And I think it further propelled uh, Studio Ghibli's growing um, presence in in a Western film mainstream. You know, I think it's quite a, a, a breath of fresh air because the film doesn't dwell in the misgivings and the mistakes of mankind, but rather it celebrates the innocence and the naivety of childhood that celebrates the little things and the often overlooked and taken for granted things such as, you know, wildlife and the nature around us. So thanks for listening. If you like my content, please uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and also feel free to uh, drop a comment with your thoughts because um, I'm always up for discussing these themes further. And of course, you know, if you have contrary opinions to what I've discussed, you know, I'm always up for discussing these in the comments section as well.